I'm Matt. I'm on the team here at St. Philip's. And what I want to do tonight is explore a core part of Jesus' life and ministry. So I want us to look tonight at Jesus' ascension. Now, we've kind of been touching on it a little bit in the morning sermon series. If you've not listened to any of the talks, I really encourage you to listen to it. I think it's been fantastic. So we're going to cover it. This idea again this, uh, tonight, Jesus' ascension. And I would say Jesus' ascension, the, this moment of Jesus' life is actually rarely talked about in the church. Uh, one of my old uh, Bible college lecturers playfully remarked that um, in the church at large today, there is the condition of ADD, ascension deficit disorder. <laughs> now... That really stuck with me, and I think it's true, and it's certainly been true in my life. I've had ADD, and, um, and I think it occurs because we often see the ascension as that moment where Jesus says goodbye, and he goes home, and it's a swift escape or a swift journey home. And so, there, you know, it seems well, there's not much to talk about. We don't talk much about people's swift goodbye. But um, do you know what? The New Testament actually pays a heck of a lot of attention to the ascension because... Um, as you know, in the New Testament, it pulls in loads of Old Testament scriptures to explain what, what's happening with Jesus and who Jesus is. Well, the Old Testament scripture used the most is Psalm 110, which is all about the ascension of Jesus. So that's the one used the most in the New Testament. So to the New Testament writers, the ascension was absolutely <coughs> fundamental. It was incredibly important to understand who Jesus is and what he's done, but it's also really important to figure out who we are as Christians. And uh, so tonight I want to explore why it's so important, why it's so incredible, and, uh, and why the New Testament writers really wanted to keep hammering home. The ascension of Jesus changes everything. So what I'm going to do is read the moment it happens in Acts 1. There's a moment just at the end of Luke, and then it's replayed again more so in Acts 1, and it should come up on the screen. If you've got a Bible, very welcome to turn to it, but I'll I'll read it out. Here we go. So Acts 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote in the Gospel of Luke all about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit." Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After this, after he'd said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, And a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. That's the opening of Acts 1. Now tonight... I want to explore three aspects of this moment and what it means for us. And uh, I I think it really is life-changing. And I hope we just, yeah, let's just open our hearts to this revelation that we receive in the ascension of Jesus. So the first thing that we learn with the ascension of Jesus is that he is taken to the highest place for his enthronement as king of all creation. So the ascension is his coronation as the king of all things. Okay, is that right? Sorry, Paul, bad timing. (laughs) Now, there we go. The ascension of Jesus is his coronation and exaltation as king. Now, 
The heavenly reign of Jesus is partly conveyed with the mention of him passing through clouds. Now, this is not merely a, a weather report, okay? So, that, you know, this is yeah, it's just, yeah, it, that was, it wasn't really what, was, what this was about. You know, there's something far more significant, far more uh, theologically significant with this idea of Jesus passing through clouds. Now, why? Now, there was this cherished prophecy this prophetic image in Scripture for Israel, and it lay in this hopeful, the hopeful words of Daniel 7, 7, 9 to 10, and verses 13 to 14. And it's describing how the beastly empires in our world are ultimately no match for God's kingdom and his coming Messiah, who's coming with the clouds of heaven. The clouds of heaven meaning God's, it's an image for God's glorious presence, his divine majesty. So clouds are quite a helpful image to use for that. And this is the scripture, and it's beautiful. This is, this is the prophecy of one to come who'd enter into heaven through clouds, coming with the clouds of heaven. In my vision at night, said Daniel, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, a human being, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So Jesus' ascension through the clouds is a signal that Daniel's vision is being fulfilled of a son of man, a human being, found worthy to enter what the Bible depicts as the very helm and control room of the universe in heaven. That's what heaven is. Everything happens that really needs to happen functions on the throne. That's where Jesus went to, to control and direct all of history. He came, went through the clouds, coming with the clouds into the throne room of God. He is the king. And he's the king over all things from heaven. Now, I find when this image of the ascended Christ enters our hearts and our minds, it changes how we see our experience and how we see our our place in this world. Because what we find is that when we're in Christ, in a relationship with Jesus, and when we're worshipping him and praying to him, we find ourselves actually at the epicenter of reality, where the party is. Because this is the risen Lord, the ascended Lord, This is the epicenter. He is the epicenter of life. And we find ourselves in the loving presence of one who promised to be with us to the end of the age. Now, I love the message version of this passage, Ephesians 1, 20 to 23. And it kind of talks about this, how when we worship Christ, we find ourselves at the very center of life. It says this, God raised him from death and set him on a throne in deep heaven in charge of running the universe, everything from galaxies to governments, no name and no power exempt from his rule, and not just for the time being, but forever. He is in charge of it all. He has the final word on everything. And at the center of all this, Christ rules the church. The church, you see, is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. We're not on the margins of mainstream culture. We're right bang in the middle where life is, where true life is found in relationship with Jesus. And so with this ascended, glorified, risen, Lord of all, when we have challenges in life, we're coming to the glorious epicenter of life. So Jesus' ascension is is his coronation as king, but it's not only that, it's more. It's secondly, his journey as a priest, as a high priest, to bring humanity in the most holy place. Now, this sounds like, I've heard this before, for this multiple times over the upcoming, um, in the last weeks, and that's right, and it's been amazing to explore it. And so what I want to do, uh, to not repeat what Paul and I have, have shared and what's been prayed and worshipped, I'm going to try and provide another angle to this theme that the ascended Jesus is his journey as a priest, and I'll try and explain it with this different angle. So, when we first began this sermon series, I talked about how Adam and Eve were made to be priests. A priest is someone who has close communion with God, that they can walk straight up to God. 
Adam and Eve walked with the Lord in the cool of the day. They had that intimacy. But a priest also from that position goes back and then extends blessing um, to the world and to people. And that's what they were called to do, to be fruitful and to multiply and to extend God's blessing to all creation. Adam and Eve were priests. Now, that we see that their priestly calling, they, they don't forfeit it, but they walk in disobedience. And it sets off, and you read it very quickly, sets off a chain reaction, particularly through Genesis, but through the world. Their children, Cain, kills Abel. Also, Adam and Eve, they, they were hiding from God. We see this chain reaction of shame and violence and oppression. And later on, there's a city, Babel, Babel, so it becomes this oppressive empire. So it just, it's this chain reaction from Adam and Eve, who are priests. It just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And so in Scripture, we find that Adam is deemed as the pioneer and the representative of all humanity. So he was like the first one, but he's kind of depicted as like the head of human beings, um, whose priestly vocation so often fills the world with violence rather than blessing. And so we read in Romans 5, Therefore sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people, because all sinned. Now Jesus is the high priest, and he turns the story around through his obedience and faithfulness. He's what's called in the New Testament the last Adam, or the second Adam, because he represents a new stage in humanity's relationship with God. Now, I love this. We read, actually, um, of Jesus' faithful priestly work as a human being. Um, Actually, before he became a human being, there's a passage in Hebrews 10 where it's on the eve of him coming into the world, and he's having a conversation with the Father. That's That's what it presents in Hebrews 10. And Jesus starts talking to the Father, and he uses... Jesus talks to the Father, or the Son, I call him the Son, talks to the Father, using Psalm 40. And the son says this to the father, a body you have prepared for me, here I am to do your will. So the son is about to enter into the world and be a faithful priest like Adam was. And you know, we've talked quite a lot about Israel's high priests, what they do, they put on this garment and it would have 12 stones and it would represent Israel. They go before God and they bring Israel on their behalf, wearing this, this breastplate and this garment. Well, the son, in essence, does that. He puts on a flesh suit. <laughs> he, he wears human skin. The son becomes flesh. The word becomes flesh. Jesus clothes himself in our flesh to restore the broken relationship between God and humankind. And it's wonderful because it means the son, the son of God, God the son, loves us so much that he becomes what we are. And then he continues his perfect and eternal relationship with his father inside of our humanity. He's wearing, he's one of us, even to death. And what Jesus is doing, and we see this particularly in the wilderness story, is that he's replaying the human story, the temptations with with Satan, the wilderness journeys like Israel. He's replaying the human story and winning and being obedient, where humanity before that has never been obedient fully. Jesus is always obedient, and he's living, the Son is living inside this human skin to heal it, because we can't heal our human condition. And then so Romans 5, which I mentioned before, says this, but the gift of Jesus is not like the the, the sin of Adam, for if the many died by the sin of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. So Jesus becomes this perfect human priest. And then in the ascension, and we've talked about this, Jesus, the a human being, the son of man, goes back to God and carries as our representative a healed humanity to the closest proximity to God. And we've talked about this. It, we see a human being sat next to God, no division to signal the renewed and reconciled union between humanity and God. When you see a human being sat next to God, 
it, it, it's confirmation of what we read. I think it's in 2 Corinthians. God has reconciled the world to himself. And in fact, so much so, there is, Jesus is now, in a, he's returned home, as it were, but in a new form. He's not the same as when he left. He's now the God-man. Does that make sense? He was the son. He had that conversation with the father. You prepared a body for me. I'm now going to do your will. I'm going to lead people into your presence. And he returns back, having been so faithful. He is the perfect union, God and man. Jesus has brought humanity back to God. And so in Hebrews 9, 24, it says, For Christ entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. And so Jesus carries on him my name and your name in heaven. And it's those who gladly acknowledge Jesus as kingly rule, who bow the knee and whose tongue confess that he's Lord, find themselves in that closest communion with the Father. And that's what we've been exploring the last number of weeks. And I just think we need to revel in that. Because it's very easy for us as Christians to try and seek God's approval when we are as close to him as possibly can be through Christ, our great high priest. Isn't that absolutely beautiful? This stuff is profound. And I, I'm so thankful that one of the, the cool things about eternity is that we get to talk to Jesus about this stuff. And he can explain, how does this all work? And then the last thing, Jesus' ascension marks his turning point uh, in his role as a prophet or as the prophet. When Jesus came to the world, he was God's word. Prophet declares a word. He is God's word. He demonstrates through his life, through his teaching, through his death, his resurrection, the nature of God. He was the ultimate prophet that Moses promised would come in Deuteronomy 18, 15. There was a, there was a promise prophecy that the prophets greater than Moses would come that's Jesus now in Jesus ascension his ministry which we, we talk about being three years long and we kind of when he went when he goes away we kind of think well that's Jesus ministry done but it's not it's only as Luke says the beginning and his ministry as a prophet one who's speaking and acting in his, those three years it's only just begun it's now carrying on now, Jesus' prophetic ministry and his whole ministry as king and as priest continues from heaven. And it means from heaven, he's not actually, he's not limited now. Whilst he's, he's in heaven, his, his activity is not limited to just one place. When he was on earth, he was in Jerusalem or Galilee or you know, Nazareth. He was located in one place. But now in heaven, there's actually, well, we're going to talk about this now, he's able to extend himself in many different ways, because he does this by sending his spirit. Jesus talked frequently, um, if I don't go, the spirit can't come. So Jesus ascends, and then the spirit's poured out, and he continues to speak and act and teach and move and heal simultaneously in your hearts, and then the guys down the road in Canesham or Saltford, and in Scotland, and in India, and New Zealand. And I've seen it. I've lived in different countries and worshipped with different people. Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, is working in their hearts at exactly the same time, as it were, or you know, simultaneously. Jesus on the earth would have been located in one place, now in heaven, pouring out the Spirit. He is continuing to work, continuing to teach. And that is what, that's what Acts is about. That's what Luke is saying right at the beginning. Uh, the Gospel of Luke was his, uh, Jesus' is the beginning of his work. Now there's more to come. Now Jesus continues to speak as a prophet from heaven, not only by the Spirit working all throughout the world. Um, so Jesus' work is almost multiplied. He works through us. He works through his people. And actually, um, he works through the people who saw him ascend. And... Uh, there's actually a really interesting clue with, with, um, with, seeing, with Jesus ascending and this, these, the disciples watching him go. There's a real interesting and fascinating clue because this, this moment's actually happened before in the Bible. It's not the first time it's happened. The first time it happened was in the story of Elijah and Elisha. And with Elijah, 
This is in 2 Kings 2, verses 1 to 14. Elijah is this prophet, powerful prophet, loads of miracles. And Elijah is told by the Lord, I'm going to take you. You've lived, lived so faithfully, I'm going to take you to my side. Um, and Elisha's really struggling with that. Elisha is the, his apprentice, doesn't want his, his mentor to go. But Elijah says to Elisha, when I go, I'm taken. If you see me go, then uh, the Lord will impart a double anointing on you. Elisha sees Elijah go, receives that spirit, that anointing, and the account of two kings is that Elisha does double the amount of miracles as, Eli- as Elijah. Now, in Acts, the same thing happens. Jesus goes, the disciples look up, and they receive his anointing, the Spirit of Christ at Pentecost. It comes. That anointing, the greater works, comes. So that, the, so that Jesus is, again, not limited just in one place at one time. So there's a queue of people who want healing or prayer or a conversation Jesus is now replicated through his disciples all over the world. The work, the prophetic word, the prophetic work, the speaking work of Jesus is now amplified through you. Jesus is in you, Tim, in you, Beth, in you, Jay, and you go off in all your areas of life. Jesus is speaking through you. You've received the anointing the anointing of the Spirit of God. And so Jesus is still speaking as a prophet. So, the ascension of Jesus, what we see is that he fulfills, uh, I don't know if you've kind of twigged this, but Israel's, Israel had basically three types of leaders, a threefold office it's sometimes called, king, priest, and prophet. So the Old Testament, the whole story of Israel's history and leadership was actually paving the way to Jesus. Jesus is the true king, priest, and prophet. He is the name above all names. All scripture points to Jesus. And there's a beautiful scripture in Philippians 2. that God exalted him to the highest place. He gave him the name that's above all names. We're the ones that bow our knees and our tongues confess that he is Lord. And it's all to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Isn't that so beautiful? We worship, every time we worship, we worship the ascended Lord. This is really important stuff. Praise be to Jesus. So what I think we should do is just worship. So let's stand together, guys, and just pour out our hearts to our king, our priest, our prophet, the one who's changed our lives. So... um, Yeah, guys, let's go for it.